I'll, I'll be talking about a real-time method for LiDAR odometry and mapping. Um, contemporary laser survey is usually conducted in this way. Uh, users set up a laser scanner at a few fixed spots to collect the data. Then there is a post-processing step that globally optimizes these overall data sets, connects them to build a one-piece map. Uh, the process is slow and uh, tedious. Um, what we want to do here is take a 3D laser scanner as an example in the left figure. Um, we take the point cloud from the LiDAR uh, and we want to do motion estimation on the move in real time. And with the estimate motion, we want to register the LiDAR point cloud to build a map of the traverse environment. Uh, we say that uh, there is motion prior because there is a linear motion model in it that we're going to talk about it later. Um, our work is the most relevant to um, the, the most relevant work to ours is a system called ZBD. This is a 2D laser and IMU attached to a spring. Users manually oscillate the device. There is a batch optimization method that processes segmentations of the data sets uh, to solve for motion. So this system works really well, well uh, but only good for offline applications. Now in comparison, our method is a real-time method. And the reason that it achieves real-time performance is nothing but separation of the problem into two sub-problems, such that each sub-problem is easier to solve. There is an odometry step that focuses only on local point clouds, removes distortion in the point cloud caused by extrinsic motion of the LiDAR. Then there is a mapping step, uh, match the local point cloud to the map, and build a map. The odometry step matches local point cloud to local point cloud. That way, uh, it has a lower computational cost. It is able to run at a higher frequency. It uses a linear motion model to compute the velocity of the LiDAR, and with the computed velocity, it removes distortion uh, in the point cloud. But also because the odometry step only matches local point cloud to local point cloud, it has a lower fidelity. The motion estimation is subject to drift. Then the, the mapping step comes in to further process the point cloud. It takes the local point cloud and matches it to the current map field. Uh, this step takes much longer time to converge. The mapping step runs at the lower frequency uh, to enforce accuracy on the map. There is no motion model in the mapping step because distortion is removed. Uh, it's more similar to a standard ICP method. Uh, in both steps, we use feature points as edge points and planar points. Uh, after we extract these points, we find the correspondences in another point cloud. For an edge point, we find an edge line segment, and for a planar point, we find a, a local planar surface. And the motion estimation is to minimize these overall distances from the features to their uh, correspondences. Here we're showing results of mapping a staircase. We use an IMU to compensate for the nonlinear motion. And the proposed method uh, only deals with linear part of the motion. We also test on a flying uh, a small helicopter. Uh, we fly it around a small bridge and in the end, we were able to build a point cloud map of the bridge. Uh, instead of using IMU, we also have the option of using a monocular camera to work with the 3D LiDAR. We have a viral dumpster method running at 60 hertz. This is on a regular laptop computer with four cores. The viral dumpster handles fast motion and the proposed scan matching method come in at one hertz uh, to refine the motion estimates. The result is that uh, we are able to move much faster because of the viral dometry, and we also see improved accuracy. Um, what we found is that um, when we map an environment that has loops uh, with 10 to 15 meter diameter, um, we don't necessarily need a loop clearer method. The point cloud is able to naturally merge with itself. For example, these loops, um, it's all because of the accuracy of the odometry method itself. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Igor from University of Washington, and in this talk I'm going to discuss using trajectory optimization to help training of very general policies based on neural networks that can be used for interactive control. Um, now, learning general control policies has been a very difficult optimization problem, um, and typically a lot of need assumptions needed to be made. However, one very promising approach that we have been pursuing in our lab uh, has been to use trajectory optimization, um, which is able to automatically solve a wide range of very difficult control problems. But unfortunately, what you get is a single static trajectory, so it cannot be used for interactive control. So what we propose, propose in this work is one very large joint optimization problem, where the variables that we have are going to be a collection of trajectories, one to end here, each of which must, <clears throat> say, satisfy a particular task. For example, trajectory one here um, must be such that the robot moves forward two meters. Or trajectory n here must be such that the robot moves backward one meters. In addition, we're simultaneously going to optimize for parameters of a single shared policy that is able to reconstruct all of these trajectories one to n that we saw and then hopefully use that to generalize to new tasks that it hasn't seen. So one way of thinking about this is in the right, left to right direction where the trajectories one to n can act as the training data for a now supervised policy learner. But because this is a joint problem, things can also flow in the other direction where the learner is able to influence the trajectories such that they become an easier data set to fit. So, for example, there's many ways that a robot can move forward two meters, but we're going to be preferring the ways that are easier for a policy function to do, to regress, or to reconstruct. So, unfortunately, the result is a very, very large problem uh, with many variables, and so what we're going to do is apply recent methods in distributed optimization, such as alternating direction method of multipliers, to break up this very large problem into a collection of say, independent and independent trajectory optimization problems in a single regression problem. And there are some additional factors related to the algorithm that we have to update. And uh, I don't want to go into the details here, but you can see our poster right after this for more. <laughs> now, then the actual policy that we're going to be used uh, are going to consist of multi-layer neural networks, where the input to the policy is going to be the state of the robot at any particular point in time. And we're going to be training the neural network weights such that um, as the output of the network will be the controls at that point in time along the trajectory. We can also use an older method of tangent propagation to recover, well, how do the controls change with respect to our current state? And we're going to be training the network to, for those so that they match uh, the optimal feedback gains that we get from the optimization. And that's a subtle detail that actually helped us a lot um, in um, making this method work. So we've tried applying the method to, say, generating controller policies for a swimmer that you see here that starts off in a stationary random pose and must reach a particular velocity. We've also tried to apply the method to the control of a human 3D arm that was trained on discrete reaching movements and were able to generalize to new discrete reaching locations, or the same policy can generalize just to an interactive continuous dragging task. Uh, we're also able to change the model so that here we've stiffened up the elbow, used the exactly the same policy, and it's still able to perform, like, do sensible things. We've also trained the policy for a biped um, planar walker uh, that must reach a particular location. And the thing here is that there's no additional information or assumptions being made. Like, so there's no motion capture data being used or hand-created uh, control policies with like, footstep locations. Like the policy, the, this neural network policy automatically learns that to move to a particular location, you have to make something like a collection of footsteps. And the output, like as we change here, you can see the rollouts of the policy. And as we change the target, um, things vary fairly smoothly. Uh, we've also applied the similar ideas of ADMM, distributed optimization, to find really robust policies that can then be executed um, on real physical robots. So we're very excited about this work, and if you want to hear more, please see our poster. Thanks. Hi, I'm Neil Segmiller, and I'll be presenting work with Alonzo Kelly 
on motion modeling for wheeled mobile robots. And the presentation is going to cover both the kinematic models in the paper and dynamic models. So mobile robots are no longer confined to just driving in hallways. Some are exceptionally mobile. For example, Crusher on the right has an articulated suspension for traversing outdoor obstacles. But often, this high mobility is underutilized when operating autonomously. And one reason is the difficulty of producing fast and accurate motion models for motion planning. And so uh, what we've done is we've done our best to develop high fidelity 3D dynamic models so vehicles like Crusher can plan their way over ditches and walls. And with higher fidelity models, mobile robots can potentially traverse rougher terrain, drive more aggressively, and manipulate heavier payloads. So we're focusing on two research areas. The first is the formulation of high fidelity motion models that are general, modular, and fast enough for predictive motion planning. And our particular formulation is unique in its use of constraints to enforce realistic, nonlinear models of wheel-train interaction. Some alternatives available, like Open Dynamics Engine, can only enforce uh, an approximation to Coulomb friction. And we're also conducting research on the online calibration of model parameters. Our method directly optimizes predictive accuracy over extended horizons. So we've implemented software libraries based on our modeling research. And with just a few lines of code, we can construct a dynamic model for any configuration, including complex ones like Crusher, and simulate it over a 1,000 times faster than real time on an ordinary PC. The ditch on the right is just a half meter deeper than the one on the left, but that makes it just a little bit too steep for Crusher to drive out of due to the uh, traction limits. And so given accurate uh, physics-based models, we believe that autonomous vehicles can plan better trajectories in complex environments like this. And uh, we've developed both uh, dynamic and kinematic model formulations, and we've started to evaluate them on physical data sets. So this is a data set collected on Crusher at Camp Roberts, and the blue lines represent the measured path of the vehicle over a four-second interval. The red lines are the predicted path using a common differential drive kinematic model, and the green lines are the predicted path using our kinematic model. And we've enhanced the kinematics to correctly predict non-zero wheel slip, which improves the accuracy significantly. Of course, predictions can never be completely accurate because there are sensor noise and random disturbances. But we do calibrate a model of this uncertainty online. And the ellipses represent covariance estimates at one second intervals. We've evaluated our methods on a number of vehicles and terrain types. Here are some results for a skid steered vehicle driving on grass, asphalt, and dirt. And the blue lines represent GPS ground truth. We also show 20 meter predicted path segments. The red path segments are predicted using a conventional kinematic model, and the green path segments are predicted using our calibrated enhanced kinematic model. And by accounting for slip, we reduce the prediction errors by 50 to 90 percent. So in the paper, we describe developing these enhanced kinematic models, which in practice can be just as accurate as full dynamic models, but up to five times computationally faster. And finally, here are 3D odometry results for the passively articulated Zoe rover. In this particular test, Zoe drove laps around a course with four ramp-shaped obstacles. And we show dramatic improvement in odometry accuracy when calibrating online as opposed to using the manual calibration and we need using 3D versus 2D kinematics. And uh, we are, so in this particular test, after driving for 200 meters, the odometry error was less than 30 centimeters and 3 degrees in yaw without using a gyroscope. So I, I ask you to please come and visit me at the interactive session. I plan on making our software libraries open source and I'm interested in collaboration. And I, this work has potential applications in planning, control, estimation, and teleoperation. Thank you. No questions. OK. I have one question for uh, number four, uh, G4. The, G, yeah, the neural network, yep. How do you determine the structure of the network? Ne ne of the network? Uh, for the optimization? Um, so at the moment, we haven't worried too much about what the structure is going to be. Right now, it's just been kind of 
three layer neural network with a fixed number of hidden units each. And I guess we've done a little bit of development like what inputs you feed to the network, but the results weren't very sensitive towards them. Is, is the same structure for any trajectory? And it's the same structure, like yeah, the same structure has been used for all of the tasks that you saw, okay. essentially. Uh, but you could potentially yeah, do more on like figuring out the right structure or figuring out the right features. Yeah. Yep. A question for Neil. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the, the wheel train interaction and, and how much is, is it good enough just to model the, the vehicle or is it really just as important to model the train itself and the, the interaction of the two? Okay. Is this my guess? Uh, so. It's important to model both. Obviously, like the wheel slip depends on the soil properties as well as the parameters of the tire. And so uh, in our formulations, in our dynamic models, it's actually modular such that you can plug in any type of wheel train interaction model, including tear mechanics base or empirical models for pneumatic tires. And then you can calibrate the parameters that affect wheel slip online, which would include soil properties as well as vehicle properties. Any other questions? There, then. Uh, it, it doesn't matter that much for rotation or translation, um, because for when we don't have anything. I mean, or a uh, monocular camera, we have to move fairly slow because we have to satisfy the linear, linear motion assumption. Um, but when we have an IMU, we use IMU to compensate for the rotation. And when we use a uh, monocular camera, we have virodometry to do that. Okay, let's thank the uh, presenters again. Hi, I'm again. Tell me, Dave context-sensitive grounding of uh, natural language to model manipulation instruction. Uh, it's a joint work with Jiong Seung, Kevin Lee, and Ashutosh Saxena. It's imperative for the robots to be able to communicate with human beings, and for most non-expert users, natural language is one of the obvious choice. However, grounding natural language is a fairly difficult task. Take an example of making sweet tea and the following description. Heat a cup of water and then add a tea bag to it. Mix it well and serve. We see words like mix it well, like what does that mean? Like what does it mean to mix something well? And words like serve. In fact, even if we ignore these kind of challenges and focus on just on a small part of the sentence, like heating a cup of water, that itself is quite challenging. Consider this environment. Uh, it has a cup, a microwave, and a stove in the background, and a sink. Well, if the cup has water, then you can heat it in one of the multiple ways. But it could also be the case that the cup is empty, in which case the uh, description does not specify that you have to fill the cup with water. And that dismissing instruction, which is fairly common in uh, real language data, it needs to be handled. Another type of challenge that arises is where the language is not necessarily consistent with the environment. For example, the person might tell you, get me a cup of water, but there's no cup. There might be a glass. And so in this situation, you can either ask for clarification, like using some inverse scale semantics models, or you can use the uh, glass instead. So these situations usually arise where, say, the person has partial knowledge of the environment. The person might be in a different environment, or it might be uh, disabled. Disabled. There could also be situations where there might be both a class and a cup, in which case there just might be just too many ways to do the same thing. For example, you might use a cup, you might use a class, you might pour water from the class into the cup, and so on and on. So these different uh, ways of doing the same thing, which are all consistent with the uh, environment, and you need to find a probabilistic reasoning which gets you the uh, best way to do it. Thus, we, uh, we saw in the previous slides that the uh, grounding depends upon the environment, but the grounding also depends upon the arguments of the sentence. Consider these two similar looking sentences, uh, heat a cup of water and heat a cup of milk. As we see that the grounding of these two uh, sequence, of these two instructions is uh, very different as il il illustrated by, uh, by the instructions in red color. And this means that we cannot assume a kind of like this injective mapping that we had, like, okay, whenever I'm gonna see heat x of y, I'm gonna just use this template. Another thing that we see is that even a small part of the sentence, like heating a cup of water, can ground to a sequence which is fairly large. 
even if we make a weak assumption that there are only 10 objects in the environment and only 10 action primitives, the number of possible sequences of length 10 could be of the order of 10 to the power 20, which is uh, fairly big even if we do some kind of trimming. Thus, what we need is an effective inference algorithm. In our paper, we propose the following uh, new language grounding approach, which models the relationship between the language, the environment, and the instruction sequence by a CRF with latent node. Here, the top layer, L, represents the language, which could be a sentence like, heat a cup of water. Uh, the middle layer, E, represents the environment, and the bottom layer, I, represents the instruction sequence. We also introduce this latent instruction node, which is uh, there to handle the missing instruction. The edges here in the CRF models the relationship uh, between these uh, nodes. However, we now need uh, data to be able to test our model. And for that, we built this online gaming environment called Tell Me Day, which had two types of tasks. In the first task, users were briefly described a situation, which could be something like make me ramen or make me a cup of coffee or clean the room, and were asked to write uh, natural language descriptions for doing it. In the second type of task, users were given descriptions written by other users, and were asked to control a robot in a first-person perspective to accomplish as close as possible to the given uh, scenario. We were able to collect uh, 700 data points, and uh, we plan to re re release it soon. Here, each data point consists of the environment, the language, and its grounding. Here are some of the examples from our corpus, and these two are the ones that a model can handle. As you can see for this sentence, fill the pot with ramen and water and then cook it is uh, fairly ambiguous. In our paper, we reported our results on 200 data points on which we were able to get 64% accuracy uh, with the ground truth sequence. And these are some of the tasks that uh, are there in our corpus. We also have this uh, robotic demonstration where the person <laughs> describes the task of making an avocado recipe to a robot in the natural language. And then the robot infers a sequence of action by watching people play a game and then executes it. For example, here the robot is uh, scooping ice cream from an ice cream and putting it into the uh, bowl. And each day, our, our more and more people play the uh, Tell Me Dave game, the robots can learn more and more tasks. Um, thank you, and please, for all the details. Come to our poster, which is G6. Hello, everyone. I'm Laden from the University of Freiburg, and I'd like to introduce to you our work on uh, sparsification with uh, nonlinear factors in the context of SLAM. So consider a situation where you have lifelong, uh, lifelong SLAM scenario. Uh, as the robot moves, it will keep adding uh, nodes and edges to a uh, factor graph to keep itself updated with its own position in the world. Unfortunately, uh, as you can see also in the movie, as time goes forwards, uh, the number of nodes and edges grows unbounded. Therefore, at some point, it is necessary to throw away some information to keep uh, efficiency for computation. Uh, so how do you do exactly that? Uh, one particular way you could uh, approach this problem is to marginalize the variable, some, uh, some nodes. Unfortunately, this has the small problem that you need to compute uh, a sure complement, uh, which will give you a dense information matrix. And uh, since the sure complement works, works on a linear approximation, you will also commit to a particular linearization point, which might not necessarily be uh, the final one. Furthermore, uh, since uh, you now have a, a, an information matrix and not an actual graph any longer, uh, it is not actually intuitive how to go back to the uh, factor graph structure. So the way we approach this is that uh, we uh, remove nodes on a one-by-one -one basis. So for example, take this graph here. Uh, the circles uh, represent the nodes, while the squares represent the factors. And we're interested in removing uh, uh, the node xk. So the first thing we will do is, com to, is to compute the Markov blanket of the node. That means uh, uh, to compute also the neighboring nodes of, uh, of xk and the factors connecting those nodes. We will then uh, remove all the other nodes and just consider the Markov blanket, optimize it, this will give us uh, an independence from the current linearization point. We will then marginalize xk, which will give us a fully dense information matrix, which uh, in this graph here is represented as a set of connections between the variables. And we will then choose a topology between those connections, a sparse topology, which best represents, uh, which best uh, approximates, let's say, the original distribution. This can be either done with a pseudo Cho Liu approximation or a subgraph approximation. Given this topology and some measurement functions, which are nonlinear, we will then compute uh, 
the best factors with respect to the callback library divergence, which means computing mean and covariance for those factors. And this is a, a convex optimization problem. Finally, we'll take those factors we computed, put them back in the original graph instead of the uh, factors we had attached to the, uh, to the XK node. And uh, uh, this will give us a new linearization point, which we are robust to. Uh, our method has some particular advantages. First and foremost, the fact that uh, the optimization problem for the computation of the factors uh, is uh, convex. Therefore, we are able to compute uh, uh, always the global optimum and uh, efficiently. Not only that, uh, for the particular instance of uh, tree topology, we're even able to give a closed form solution to the problem. Uh, then we do not really require a, a global uh, uh, linearization point. In fact, uh, we are totally abstract from it by optimizing the Markov blanket. Um, we, we can use any nonlinear measurement function. Uh, in this particular work, we restricted ourselves to uh, relative SE2 measurements, but any can be used in principle. And finally, since we are computing actual factors and not working on the information matrix, uh, we will preserve the Brock structure of the information matrix. So we evaluated our approach against uh, that of uh, uh, Carlevaris Bianco and Eustis, uh, which is generic linear constraints, uh, onto the maps. Uh, we considered uh, uh, three particular scenarios of testing. Uh, one is the full incremental one, where we remove node as soon as they arrive into the graph. The other one is uh, a periodic batch sparsification, where we remove nodes once every 100 iterations. And uh, finally, a global sparsification. Uh, we achieve uh, better results in uh, incremental and uh, periodic batch sparsification, particularly in the incremental scenario. Uh, for example, here uh, you can see the results in, in terms of uh, callback library divergence for an incremental version of the Manhattan dataset. Uh, for the global scenario, uh, we can achieve better results, but only at the cost of sparsity. So for further information, I urge you to come to our uh, poster presentation, which is G7, I believe, and thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Lan Tao Liu, and uh, this is my talk, Fully Decentralized Task uh, Swaps uh, with the Optimized Local 13. So um, we consider the classic task allocation problem uh, that, that assigning, assigns n robots to n tasks for which the final uh, goal is, for which the final solution is a one-to-one -one mapping. This form of a task allocation can be represented with a, a table or matrix where the row indices are, are robots and the column indices are tasks. The optimal solution is, uh, is highlighted in red circles, and we can simplify the final solution with the matrix with only binary values, as shown in the rightmost matrix. Now, the goal is to design a decentralized method. More specifically, we want to remove the dependency between sequential steps of a centralized optimal assignment uh, swapping method. Uh, with, while considering only local information and a single half communication. Uh, we want to design a method that can optimize the local 13 and uh, convert the, so the, the solution as uh, quickly as uh, possible. Now imagine that if we change the task allocation results, we have to guarantee that uh, the new solution to be feasible, meaning that uh, in each row and each column, there is only one row assigned at any time. When the assignment is changed or permuted, a cyclic path is formed, which can be used to track assignment changes. The, left, the, the cyclic operation in the left matrix describes exactly the task swaps in the right figure. This operation can also be uh, formulated with the matrix uh, operation as shown below. More generally, the, each such cyclic operation can be uh, belonged to the so-called permutation group for example, the lowercase, the lowercase letter di at the bottom describes a series of permutations, and uh, the, the pi here is the, randomly, the random initial solution. So, however, um, however, to reach the same solution, there might be different sequences, and uh, some are faster, and uh, some may be slower. This is analogous to playing the, the Rubik's Cube, 
as we know that uh, different strategies may result in quite distinct solving time. So in our problem, if an agent is involved in more than in multiple permutation, this operation will have to be carried out following certain order, meaning that uh, the operation cannot be done in a concurrent or parallel manner. This is called the stage dependency, uh, which is a hurdle for designing decentralized methods. So we have mitigated such a dependency by decomposing the sequential and uh, dependent cycles into concurrent and uh, non-dependent uh, permutations, which, however, relies on a small, a small residue cycle with only three agents. In other words, the decomposed larger cycles can be executed in the concurrent, in the decentralized manner, conditioning on that uh, the residue small cycle is uh, adjusted accordingly in the later step. So another challenge, another challenge lies in the, in the solution optimization and uh, convergence. With only local information and uh, single hub communication, we want to design, we want to obtain the largest step size towards the optimal solution. Different from many other algorithms that assume global information or multi-hub communication, our permutation cycles are searched directly on the network topology. So we, we combine the duality theory and the relaxation searching technique and prove that uh, the local searching is uh, optimal uh, in terms of uh, the step size. Finally, we evaluated our method in simulation. So this algorithm is based on static network topology. The left figure shows the randomly generated locations for robots and the tasks where we want to deploy the robots to the nearest uh, task location. And the right figure shows the permutation cycles in the assigned matrix. Comparing with the sequential and uh, centralized version as shown in the, in the green line, we can observe that uh, the decentralized version converges much faster at the red line and the solution is also close to the optimum. Uh, we also show that uh, the relaxation technique also reduces the communication load, which is measured by the number of uh, the communication messages. And this is my talk, and uh, thank you for, t for your time. Hi. Um, so <laughs> I'm wondering where, so you're mapping from language to these expressions, these sort of plans in, some kind of, of symbolic language, right? Mm -hmm. Where, like, so things like pour and, and pick up and stuff like that, where does those expressions come from? Uh, where does those come from? Yeah. So uh, we created this list of like some like 10, 15 uh, primitive actions, which were uh, partly inspired by the work which uh, our lab has been doing. For example, the grasping function, which like, uh -huh. uh, uh, like people have written work. And are they like subroutine calls? Like you, you call them and then the robot goes off and does something? So yeah, like once you assume something like say grasp a cup, then you can assume that there you have like a grasp routine which will be, uh, which is fairly good at like uh, grasping a decent number of objects that are there in a common household setting. Any other question? I have uh, one for G7. Um, what are the implications? There is any loss of information if you perform the specification Obviously. once and then again in the same uh, in the same environment. In the same environment, you yeah, like, like, do it like one after one month, one specification, the next month another specification. Uh, so frankly, I would expect that. Um, mm, uh, the first time you do the sparsifications, you're going to lose more information okay. for the simple reason that uh, uh, af after some time in the future, you're basically going to, if you're revisiting the area again and again, at some point you're going to converge to one particular linearization point where you're not going to leave it. So uh, okay. the first times, the first steps in the algorithm are m actually crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Back. For, for G7. Uh, have you tried using the sparsified problem as a preconditioner for the original problem? Because it's always better to solve the original problem. And uh, you can use the sparse problem as a preconditioner. Have you tried that? Uh, what do you mean as a preconditioner? So, uh, because in this problem we're trying to uh, take one graph, remove some stuff and get another graph. Uh, 
So usually a preconditioner, you would use it in optimization. I'm not really sure about the question. Uh, can you elaborate on that? You go, I mean, for example, it's common to use as preconditioners subgraphs of the original problem. Instead of a subgraph, you could use this, the sparsified graph that you have as a preconditioner for the linear system that you solve uh, at the gauss newton iteration. Uh, I'm not too sure I understand. Uh, we can take it offline. Oh, yeah, okay, we can catch up later. Um, any other question? Uh, yeah. uh, did you look at all uh, G7? Um, when to sparsify? So there's a, a big question of how much to sparsify and when, and there's a trade-off uh, having to do with the, the fidelity of the approximation. And the follow-up to that would be, what, did, were you able to find places where the sparsification uh, led to badness, badness, bad things happening down the road? So um, when to sparsify, we didn't really consider this problem. This problem has been, de uh, has been in, par in part dealt with, uh, with the previous work like uh, uh, by, by Kretschmar, where they considered uh, uh, an information-based approach to determine which nodes to sparsify. Um, so about the second question, if uh, the, sparsification, uh, the sparsification can lead to bad instances, uh, we had no such cases in, uh, uh, in the 2D uh, particular um, problem. Uh, we tried something with, um, with three, the 3D problem, uh, but that was uh, quite, uh, let's say, um, we didn't work that much on it, so I, I cannot give you a any sort of information on that. More? Mm -hmm. uh, G6, um, in your framework, it's possible to, for the user to refine uh, the instruction after it's computer? Uh, so, so far it's just one turn, but that's something which could be a very good improvement. Okay. Here, please. Uh, one question to G8. Uh, do you have any comparison how your approach compares to using a non-decentralized optimal solution? So the, the solution, the comparison you showed was also a decentralized approach, right? I think that's just so this, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So this, uh, this work is based on the, the call, we, we call this as any time algorithm. The centralized algorithm, most of them are not any time. Clear, but there just have no a bound. Yeah, there is no, no convergence feature for that. So, but uh, the one that I show you, the, uh, I show you with the, the sequential version that we published in RSS 2012 is something that's based on, you know, the sequential task swaps. That is optimal, that is optimal. Thanks. Okay, let's thank the speakers again. Uh, now we have the poster session with coffee.